morning. My name is Michelle and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome you to Canopy Growth's second quarter fiscal 2023 financial results conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. I will now turn the call over to Tyler Burns, Director, Investor Relations. Tyler, you may begin your conference call. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us. On our call today, we have Canopy's Chief Executive Officer, David Klein, and Chief Financial Officer, Judy Hahn. Before financial markets open today, Canopy issued a news release announcing our financial results for our second quarter ended September 30th, 2022. This news release is available on our website under the Investors tab and will be filed on e Edgar and CDAR. We have also posted a supplemental earnings presentation on our website. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that our discussion during this call will include forward-looking statements that are based on management's current views and assumptions, and that this discussion is qualified in its entirety by the cautionary note regarding forward-looking statements included at the end of this morning's news release. Please review today's earnings release in Canopy's reports filed with the SEC and CDAR for various factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from projections. In addition, reconciliations between any non-GAAP measures to their closest reported GAAP measures are included in our earnings release. Please note that all financial information is provided in Canadian dollars unless otherwise noted. Following remarks by David and Judy, we will conduct a question and answer session. We will first address questions upvoted by verified shareholders. Following that, we will take questions from analysts. To ensure that we get to as many questions as possible, we ask analysts to limit themselves to one question. With that, I will turn the call over to David. David, please go ahead. Good morning and thank you for joining our call. Before I get underway, I'd like to acknowledge the results from the midterm election yesterday. With two additional states voting to legalize cannabis last night, we're seeing continued momentum for reform. And while the overall results of last night are not yet fully clear, what is abundantly clear is that Americans continue to demand access to legalized cannabis. The bipartisan appeal of cannabis cannot be overstated, and I hope the results of these midterms will further push the Senate to act swiftly on cannabis reform during the lame duck period and fully unlock this once-in-a-generation opportunity across the nation. Moving back to our earnings, today I'll speak to Canopy's progress against our strategic priorities and discuss the transformational strategy we recently announced to fast-track entry into the U.S. cannabis market through Canopy USA. Following my remarks, Judy will review our Q2 results, provide an update on our path to profitability, and comment on our short-term outlook. Our second quarter marked an inflection point for Canopy, demonstrating momentum across our key businesses and accelerating our entry into the U.S. cannabis market as we seek to seize the generational opportunity ahead of us. Q2 highlights included, in Canada, we stabilize business revenues, improve cash margins, and continue to make progress on our path to profitability. This has been achieved amidst persistent industry-wide challenges, as well as an increasingly difficult macroeconomic backdrop. In our CPG business, BioSteel delivered another record quarter with very strong sequential growth. And we continue to pursue cost savings while driving focus in our business, as evidenced by the announcement that we are divesting our Canadian retail operations. Now to provide more detail, in Canada, our efforts to premiumize our portfolio delivered a positive mix shift despite continued market fragmentation. During the second quarter, our Canadian adult use B2B premium and mainstream sales accounted for a combined 58% of sales, up from 56% last year. This showcases our resiliency in a market challenged by labor and supply chain disruptions in three of the largest provinces, Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. I'd like to take a moment to highlight our performance in the very competitive premium flower in pre-roll joint, or PRJ, segment. Supported by the recent launch of Doja OG Deluxe Flower in PRJs, 
our Doja brand increased market share by two basis points versus Q1 FY23 to 2.4%. We're also encouraged by the demand for our new seven acres flower and infused PRJs that have recently entered the market. Next in the mainstream flower and PRJ segment, our Tweed brand increased share during the quarter helped by strong demand for new Tweed branded Cushman's and wedding cake flower. We're looking forward to introducing additional exciting new products in the second half of our fiscal year. We continue to focus on operational changes in our cultivation as well as post-harvest processes and genetics that are driving higher THC percentages and improved quality. We're selling products into the market that allow for additional consumer choice, like enhanced colors and distinct terpene profiles. This is a result of listening to uh, our consumer feedback. Prime examples are the recently launched Tweed Lemon Kush, which is garnering positive comments for its flavor, and the vibrant purple color of our new Seven Acres Purple Pancakes that has received high praise. In the current quarter, we pushed the envelope with the launch of our Ace Valley Sex Gummies, Lust and Thrust. We're encouraged by the initial market response to these gummies, which represent the capabilities of Canopy's insights, product development, and marketing functions. There was a clear gap in the market and a natural fit for our focus on cannabis products tailored to specific need states. As proof, these new gummies sold out at OCS.ca in the first week of sales, leading to an immediate reorder with expedited delivery as the OCS anticipates high demand. We also continue to support our quality products with investments in our commercial ground game in Canada. I've previously highlighted the investments we're making in our bud tender engagement program, Higher Education, which in its first year has facilitated over 10,000 interactions focused on education and product knowledge. Additionally, our commercial team continues to engage with retailers across the country, which led to strong distribution gains for our top new flower, PRJ, vape, and edible products hitting the market in the current quarter. As a result of the divestiture of our retail operations, we've reduced channel conflict, which has created an opportunity to work with over 100 additional stores. It's our expectation that our Canadian adult-use B2B cannabis business will continue to show improvement in the second half of fiscal 23 due to ongoing innovation and distribution drives. Closing out our Canadian cannabis business, in Q2, our Canadian medical revenue grew 8% year-over-year, driven by expanded product offerings. Next, I'll speak to progress in our CPG portfolio. First, BioSteel delivered another record quarter in Q2, helped by strategic investments that have driven distribution and velocity gains. This resulted in nearly $30 million in revenue in the quarter, which represents sequential quarterly and year-over-year growth of 67% and 299% respectively. In the first half of fiscal 23, BioSteel secured distribution with major retailers including Walmart, Rite Aid, and Winn-Dixie. This has helped increase ACB to 34% in the U.S., which represents a sequential increase of 520 basis points according to IRI data for the 13 weeks ended on October 2nd. Now moving to Canada, BioSteel is seeing strong market share growth. According to Nielsen data covered, covering the convenience and gas channel for the four-week period ended October 8, BioSteel's share of isotonic beverage sales in Ontario reached 11.2%, representing an increase of 630 basis points versus the prior year. BioSteel's share nationally was 7.4%, which is 450 basis points higher than the prior year period. A homegrown Canadian brand, BioSteel was born in an NHL locker room and resonates with athletes from across the country. This is a blueprint for the growth that we're starting to see in the United States with a multi-year partnership that names BioSteel as the official hydration partner of the National Hockey League and the National Hockey League Players Association. The partnership provides BioSteel with rinkside marketing, product supply, and retail activation rights, as well as community engagement platforms. 
If you watch hockey, the brand is highly visible on and off the ice, and we've secured several distribution agreements in the U.S. as a result. We anticipate additional growth for the brand as the hockey season continues, and athletes, both professional and aspiring, enjoy the benefits of clean, healthy hydration, courtesy of BioSteel. Earlier this morning, BioSteel completed the acquisition of a manufacturing facility in Verona, Virginia. The acquisition of the facility from the brand's existing contract manufacturer will support the rapid growth strategy and expansion of U.S. footprint for BioSteel. This is a natural next step for the brand and creates additional business value as BioSteel continues its ascent to the top of the sports hydration category. Looking to stores in Bickle. Sales were flat when excluding foreign exchange effects, which is an improvement versus the trend established in the first quarter of fiscal 23. With this said, we are steadfast in our view that s and has a strong platform for growth given the brand's global reputation and highly premium positioning. As recreational and medical consumers continue to look for the highest quality vaporizers available, we look forward to bringing additional stores and vehicle innovation to market in the future. As you can see, the momentum is building in our Canadian cannabis and CPG businesses, and I believe we're at an inflection point as we look toward our next phase with Canopy USA. Firstly, or frankly, I think Canopy USA represents a pivotal moment in the history of Canopy growth, as we expect to fast track our entry into the US cannabis market by bringing together acreage holdings, jetty extracts, and WANA brands under the umbrella that is Canopy USA. We expect the closing of the acquisitions by Canopy USA will, be, will meaningfully enhance Canopy's growth and profitability over time once Canopy USA closes the announced acquisitions of Acreage, Jetty, and WANA. In terms of next steps, we are appreciative that the CEO of TMX Group, the owner of the TSX, has publicly indicated support for our plans, and we remain committed to continuing dialogue with our partners at NASDAQ. Additionally, we anticipate receiving comments from the SEC on our preliminary proxy statement. However, we expect to be on track to hold our shareholder vote in early calendar 2023. In summary, Canopy USA is expected to accelerate growth and market expansion through the creation of a leading house of brands capitalizing on a once-in-a-generation opportunity as we fast-track our entry into the U.S. cannabis market. Q2 marked a key inflection point for Canopy. As we continue to drive innovation, distribution, focus, and efficiency in our Canadian business, as BioSteel blazes a path forward in the sports hydration category, and as our Canopy USA strategy progresses, we've taken destiny into our own hands to rapidly achieve profitable growth. With that, I'll turn it over to Judy. Thank you very much, David, and good morning, everyone. My comments will focus on, one, a brief summary of our second quarter results, two, a review of new segments of reporting that we have introduced this quarter and the performance of those segments, three, an update on our path to achieve profitability, and four, some perspectives on the balance of our fiscal 23 outlook. Let's start with a review of our second quarter fiscal 23 financial results. In Q2, we generated net revenue of $118 million, representing a 10% decline over the prior year period. When adjusting for both the impacts of C3 and the impacts of our Canadian retail business, which were divesting, revenues increased 2%. Sequentially, net revenues increased 7% compared to Q1. Revenue highlights include BioSteel delivering another record quarter, nearly quadrupling its revenue versus the prior year period, our Australian cannabis business having its sixth quarter in a row of record revenues, and our Canadian cannabis business delivered a second consecutive quarter of stable revenue despite the impacts of labor disruptions in Quebec and British Columbia, as well as the supply chain disruptions at the OCS in Ontario. Gross margins and adjusted EBITDA have improved significantly year-over-year, year, driven by lower inventory charges in the current period as compared to the prior year, 
as well as the impact of our cost savings initiatives announced in April. Our SG&A expenses, excluding acquisition costs, declined by 10% year-over-year, even as we significantly increased our investments in biosteel with new initiatives like the NHL partnership. Free cash flow improved modestly on a sequential basis as compared to Q1. Now, following the completion of certain restructuring actions tied to our cost savings initiatives announced in April, which were aligned with our strategic review of our business, we have changed the structure of our internal management reporting. Accordingly, in the second quarter, we're reporting our financial results for the following five reportable segments. One, Canada Cannabis. Two, rest of the world cannabis, which includes U.S. CBD business. Three, stores and bickle. Four, biofuel. And five, this works. These segments reflect how our operations are managed with the performance of these segments evaluated with a focus on segment net revenue and segment gross margin. Accordingly, we're now including these metrics in our financial reporting for the first time this quarter. Canada cannabis revenues declined 27% compared to the prior year period, yet were stable sequentially compared to Q1 and Q4. We grew our Canadian medical revenue by 8% versus Q2 of last year. Our adult use B2B revenue declined 40% year over year and declined 5% compared to the prior quarter. We estimate that the labor strikes in British Columbia and Quebec as well as the cyber attack impacting the OCS, negatively impacted our Canadian adult use revenue by approximately $2 million during Q2. Canada Cannabis adjusted gross margins was a negative 15% in Q2, as margins continued to be negatively impacted by underabsorption of fixed costs and price compression, offsetting improved product mix and cost savings initiatives. Excluding depreciation and certain non-cash inventory charges and the impact of Canada Employment Wage Subsidy Program, which was zero during Q2 of this year, normalized cash gross margins for Canada cannabis improved to 16% from 7% in the prior period. In our rest of world cannabis segment, revenues excluding C3 experienced a modest decline year over year a strong growth in Australia was offset by a decline in the U.S. CBD business and the impact of shipments to Israel. We have previously referred to bulk sales to Israel as opportunistic, and the current quarter did not have any shipments to Israel. Adjusted gross margin, adjusting for inventory charges related to U.S. CBD, was 23% in the current period, down from 46%, in part driven by the C3 divestiture. BioSteel delivered its second quarter in a row of record revenues, increasing 299% as compared to the prior year period and 67% compared to Q1. Gross margins for BioSteel improved from a negative 5% in the prior year period to 15% in the current period, with the improvement due to higher revenue, increasing operating leverage, and improvements to supply chain operations. Adjusted gross margin was 26% after adjusting for certain non-recurring contract manufacturing costs. Stores and vehicle revenues decreased 7% as compared to the prior year period, due in part to the impact of the weakening euro in relation to the Canadian dollar. On a constant currency basis, stores and vehicles revenue would have been approximately $1 million higher or stable versus the prior year period. We are seeing cautious consumer spending in an uncertain inflationary environment in select European markets, and we also continue to see headwinds from distributor and ongoing supply chain challenges. That being said, we are seeing strong growth in markets like Australia, and our direct-to-consumer sales in the U.S. remains resilient. Growth margins for stores and bickle also increased to 44% from 37% in the prior year period. This works revenue decreased 24% in the current period compared to the prior year due to foreign exchange headwinds with the pound weakening significantly relative to the Canadian dollar and slower consumer spending impacting demand for discretionary items. 
On a constant currency basis, this work's revenue declined 12% versus the prior year. Adjusted gross margin in the current period is 49%, an improvement over the prior year due to product mix and less discounting activity. Adjusted EBITDA in Q2 on a consolidated basis amounted to a loss of $78 million. This was an $85 million improvement in adjusted EBITDA loss versus Q2 of fiscal 22, primarily driven by the improvement in gross margin. We note that last year's adjusted EBITDA included $87 million in inventory write-offs. Now, normalizing for the disposition of C3, the impacts of the Canada Employment Wage Subsidy Program and the inventory write-offs, adjusted EBITDA in Q2 FY23 would have improved by $20 million on a year-over-year basis. Relative to Q1, adjusted EBITDA loss widened by $3 million, which was entirely driven by increased marketing investments behind BioSteel. I'd like to now provide an update on the efforts underway to improve our profitability. On a consolidated basis, gross margin improved in Q2 versus the prior year and sequentially versus Q1 as we continue to improve our product mix in Canada cannabis segment and execute on our cost savings programs where we have committed to delivering savings of 30 to 50 million in cost of goods sold. While the majority of these savings are expected to be recognized in the second half of fiscal 23 and into first half fiscal 24, we did achieve $8 million of savings in Q2, primarily relating to headcount reductions, more efficient procurement activities, and supply chain improvements. To date, the cost savings programs have realized over $11 million of the expected 30 to $50 million in cost savings. In addition, as David mentioned, BioSteel acquired a manufacturing facility in Verona, Virginia, which will enable BioSteel to bring production of its ready-to-drink beverages in-house. This is expected to improve BioSteel's gross margins closer to that of similar premium beverages over time. The other key initiative is in reducing our SG&A expenses, where in April we announced that we have undertaken actions that we expect will reduce our SG&A expenses by 70 to 100 million over the next six, over the next 12 to 18 months. Our selling, general, and administrative expenses in the second quarter were flat versus prior year, which includes 12 million a year year over year increase in acquisition costs. Adjusting for the impact of the acquisition costs, the disposition of C3, which contributed $3 million to SG&A in Q2 of fiscal 22, and the impact of the payroll subsidy benefit, which positively impacted SG&A by $11 million in Q2 fiscal 22 and zero in Q2 of fiscal 23, SG&A expenses in the second quarter decreased by 15% or $20 million year over year. This $20 million savings is a net of the impact of wage inflation, as well as incremental sales and marketing investments in BioSteel, including the activation of the NHL partnerships, which took effect in Q2 fiscal 23. To date, the cost savings program has reduced SG&A expenses by approximately $36 million, even as we have increased our investments in key growth initiatives. At the end of Q2 of fiscal 23, we announced the divestiture of our retail operations in Canada. The operational savings from this step are expected to result in projected SG&A cost savings being closer to the high end of the annualized 70 to 100 million target range. Pressing forward on our path to profitability, we continue to evaluate opportunities to bring additional focus to our Canadian cannabis operations, including portfolio optimization, with a focus on streamlining our SKU count as we continue to premiumize our portfolio and further tighten our focus, capturing additional efficiencies across our operations and reducing costs, and applying focus and discipline to our overall SG&A costs with an eye towards variabilizing spends where feasible to match spends with business levels. Let me now spend a few minutes on our cash flow and balance sheet. 
Our free cash flow in Q2 was an outflow of $135 million. This comprised of cash outflow of operation of $133 million, which includes $41 million in interest payments in the quarter. Q2 CapEx came in at $2 million, significantly lower compared to the prior year period. For the full year 2023, we now estimate CapEx to be in the range of $10 to $20 million. In conjunction with our Canopy USA announcement, we announced two major steps we're taking to improve our balance sheet and reduce our cash interest expenses. First, we have entered into an agreement with certain of our lenders under which Canopy will tender approximately $187.5 million U.S. million of the outstanding term loan at a discounted price of $930 per thousand. The first half of the paydown will occur during this quarter. In addition, no earlier than the following the creation of the Canopy Growth Exchangeable Shares, we intend to negotiate an exchange agreement with affiliates of Constellation Brands to purchase for cancellation up to $100 million principal amount of our unsecured senior notes due July 23 in exchange for additional Canopy shares. These actions, plus the partial exchange transaction of our unsecured senior notes that took, pl- that took place in July, are expected to reduce our overall debt position by nearly $600 million. We remain committed to further enhancing the strength and financial flexibility of our balance sheet and improve our cash burn while continuing to pursue growth investments and other strategic initiatives. Our balance sheet remains strong with a $1.1 billion of cash at hand uh, at the end of Q2 and $2 billion of U.S. dollars uh, of base shelf available. Let me now provide some perspectives on our balance of fiscal 23 outlook. First, we expect continued year-over-year growth from Biosteel in the second half as the team builds on the growth in the first half with increased marketing investments, driving gains in sales velocity and new distribution. On a sequential basis, we expect Q3 to be slightly down versus Q2 with a stronger Q4 based on the timing of shipments. Our Canadian adult B2B business is expected to show continued improvement as it benefits from our premiumization strategy and new product launches. However, we expect some choppiness in the near term as we work through our portfolio optimization strategy. Our rest of the world's cannabis segment is expected to show year-over-year growth in medical sales in Germany, Australia, and other international markets, while sales to Israel are expected to be minimal in the back half of the year. While the distributor challenges and economic conditions in the first half created some headwinds for stores in Bickle, we are seeing improved U.S. distribution in the third quarter, which we expect will drive sequential growth in the second half of the year, though prior year comparisons will be challenging to repeat. I'd also note that with the disposition of the Canada retail operation has already seen 10 locations closed, which will begin to impact the Canada retail revenues starting in Q3. Second, we expect the balance of fiscal 23 to show continued progress in our profitability, with expectation of this year being a transition year as we work towards profitability, building on the cost structure improvement as we've seen in the first half, while also making strategic investments in key growth areas of our business. Lastly, Assuming a successful shareholder vote in favor of the upcoming proposal, Canopy USA is expected to exercise the rights to acquire Acreage, Jetty, and WANA. And once these transactions close, we expect to consolidate Canopy USA's financial performance into Canopy's financial statements. And as we continue to improve our focus in our Canadian business, and once Canopy USA closes the acquisition of Acreage, Jetty, and WANA, we expect Canopy's global cannabis business to be profitable on a consolidated adjusted EBITDA basis. In conclusion, we are focused on executing our path to profitability in Canada. We continue to invest in high potential opportunities, particularly in biosteel business, which is seeing strong results. And we expect Canopy USA to meaningfully improve Canopy's growth and profitability over time. 
This concludes my prepared comments. We'll now take questions. To begin Thank our Q&A session, sorry, go ahead, operator. I'm sorry. Oper operator, we will take. Operator, this is Tyler Burns. We'll take a couple questions first that we have in the queue from our Say Technologies platform. Okay, thank you. And that, okay, uh, that first question is: What is the plan for entering the U.S. market, and what is the projected time frame for this happening? So there are a number of steps. Uh, related to entering the U.S. market uh, in, under the Canopy USA structure that we announced a, a few weeks ago. Um, so the steps are, uh, the, uh, first, we were Canopy shareholders um, will vote to approve the creation of exchangeable shares. We expect that to happen in early calendar 23. Um, and then uh, Canopy will create those exchangeable, that exchangeable share class immediately upon a successful vote. We then would expect um, Constellation brands to elect to convert their common shares into those exchangeable shares. Acreage uh, shareholders also have to have a vote uh, to approve um, the acquisition of the floating shares, and we expect that to happen in early calendar 23 as well. And then Canopy USA uh, will exercise the options to acquire Acreage Jetty and WANA we expect Jetty and WANA to close in the first half of calendar 23, and we expect that the acreage closing will take longer. It could take uh, as long as 9 to 12 months in order to get all the necessary regulatory approvals. Uh, but as we said, once we get through all of that, uh, all of that uh, work, as well as uh, driving continued focus on our Canadian business, um, we expect that our business will be growing and profitable. The uh, second question is, what is your plan if NASDAQ denies the pending acquisition? So I'll take that question. So just taking a step back, first of all, Canopy shares are listed on TSX, uh, which is obviously a major exchange. And as David mentioned, uh, we are pleased that the TSX is supportive of our structure and strategy of Canopy USA. Uh, in terms of NASDAQ, uh, they have objected to the financial consolidation of Canopy USA into the financial results of Canopy Growth. So uh, it's not the structure or the strategy or the plan that they have really objected to um, at this point. It's also helpful to understand that, that uh, NASDAQ is not a regulator, um, and so uh, we're not, um, we don't require their approval of the transaction uh, per se. Uh, it's also important to understand that there is no imminent risk uh, to our listing on NASDAQ, and we're continuing to engage in constructive dialogues with NASDAQ uh, to really ensure that we are in compliance with their rules and uh, regulations and, and general policies. Uh, now, even in the event that NASDAQ continues with its objection to the consolidation, uh, there are a number of uh, potential paths, uh, and that really includes, you know, NASDAQ may accept a heightened level of disclosure for the USA assets, uh, we could also appeal a decision by NASDAQ to delist our, our, our shares if we get to that point. Um, so I just want to remind people that there's a, a lot of uh, things that have to happen uh, in the next uh, few months, and certainly we'll share more details with, uh, with people as we get more updates. Operator Judy and David will now be happy to take questions from the analysts. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press star followed by the one on your touchtone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request, and your questions will be polled in the order they are received. Should you wish to decline from the polling process, please press the star followed by the two. If you are using a speakerphone, please lift the handset before pressing any keys. To ensure an efficient call that gets to the questions of as many analysts as possible, analysts are requested to limit themselves to one question. The first question comes from Vivian Azar of Cohen & Company. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. This is Victor Ma on for Vivian Azar, and thank you for taking the question. So I just want to touch on BioSteel. Uh, sales in 2Q were held by the higher Walmart load in versus 1Q23, and, and by continued strong velocities we've seen scanner data. As you look to move some of that RTD manufacturing in-house, uh, what is your strategy on in-house versus contract manufacturing? 
And is there a target mix and a target gross margin you have in mind? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey, Victor. I'll I'll take that question. So uh, from a from a the acquisition that we announced um, uh, on the uh, the Verona facility. This is really about uh, two things. One is it really ensures the supply of Tetra Pak packaging um, in in the U.S. and and um, and even in Canada because. Uh, as you may know, uh, there is limited supply and, and capacity of Tetra Pak uh, packaging just across the industry. So it really ensures that we have uh, supply uh, that we can leverage internally uh, and really ensure that we can uh, continue to capitalize on the rapid growth that we're seeing for biosteel across, across both the U.S. And, and the Canadian market. Um, secondly, this is really also about margin improvement, um, as you probably saw in our Segmented uh, margin disclosure, uh, biosteels margin um, this quarter was around 26%. Uh, we think as we bring production in house uh, through this uh, acquisition, uh, gross margin uh, certainly will see significant improvement as we uh, reduce or obviously eliminate all the co-packing costs. There's additional savings that we would uh, garner from from uh, owning the the production facility. Uh, so over time, we would expect uh, biosteels gross margin to mirror. Uh, what you would typically see from other uh, premium beverage uh, players standpoint. Um, so all in all, it ensures supply and um, and obviously it's a margin improvement um, efforts as well. Thank you. The next question comes from Chris Carey of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Morning, Chris. I think your prior expectation, correct me if I'm wrong, was for the Canopy USA vote to happen perhaps in January, and, and now it sounds like early calendar 2023. Uh, can, can you just help us understand your um, expectation for what appears to be a bit deeper of a SEC review here, um, and, and maybe explain to the extent you can, where you think they're taking a deeper look. Um, you know, clearly other cannabis companies based in the U.S. have filings with the SEC. I'm wondering why your case would be different. So I'd, I'd love any perspective there on how you think this impacts your timeline. Thank you. I, I would I would say, um, Chris, that um, our expectation on timeline really hasn't changed all that much. We filed our proxy. Um, uh, on October 25th, uh, there is a period in which the SEC can provide comments, um, uh, it, and so maybe the, the just the change in tone into the first uh, half of the calendar year is just more uh, being conservative than anything else because our internal expectations really haven't changed. Thank you. The next question comes from Tammy Chen of BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for the question. Um, I wanted to ask about your uh, Canadian cannabis business, specifically the just the production side, the, the COGS profile. So I recall a couple of quarters ago, there were some stumbles as you were working to improve the quality of your mainstream and premium flower production. Um, could you just give... Uh, an update on that progress. Are you through all of the challenges that you've previously experienced? And is your Canadian footprint still in a position that essentially you need a lot more volume of mainstream and premium flower sales in order to get that segment into positive gross profit territory? Thank you. Yeah, good, good, good questions, um, Tammy. So as it relates to performance from our um, production uh, facilities in Canada, we've made, uh, I think, tremendous progress in terms of our ability to deliver um, high-quality um, uh, flour in particular to our consumer base, and we see that with um, some uh, market share growth and distribution growth and new products that we've launched. Uh, we. And, and, and it's been a combination of things that have gotten us there. We've we've um, continued to improve our grow processes. We've continued to look for ways uh, to improve our post-harvest processing. 
we've introduced um, new genetics and we now have a very robust pipeline of genetics that we can bring into the market. Um, so we're feeling really good about our ability to supply that, that, that super high quality um, uh, flower into the Canadian market, right? So I think, I, think, uh, I wouldn't say we're over um, all of the hurdles because we're growing a, a plant. And, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, um, agricultural, uh, the agricultural cycle can create its own issues from um, individual lots of grow to uh, a, a, the next lot. Um, but I would say that we're really pleased with where we are and feel pretty confident in our path forward. From a footprint standpoint, um, we need uh, a footprint that is um, capable of delivering our aspiration to to be a leader in the premium and mainstream categories. And, you know, we'll continue to do, um, um, you know, take actions necessary, as we always have, to improve our ability to grow and, and, and grow profitable. So, um, wouldn't... Again, I would say that we're we're on we're on track uh, with with where we'd like to be from a production standpoint. The only thing I would add, um, Tammy, is um, you know obviously we are seeing sequential improvements from a from a cash growth margin standpoint, and this is happening amidst uh, rising costs, as as you know, in, in across the industry. Um, and unlike other industries, cannabis CPI is actually still down, right? Um, so we're facing rising costs, but pricing. Uh, compression is um, is is not helpful um, in 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 the industry, um, and 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 there's still a lot of um, evolving dynamics happening in 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 the Canadian market too, right? So, um, and just to give you you know one of the examples of of what we're um, facing with, and I think it's uh, I can speak for a lot of the the, the producers is. I, I think the market really needs a more equitable distribution of profit pool. So we can adjust the footprint, we can adjust a lot of the cost structures, but the market really needs to move forward to being having a more equitable distribution of the profit pool. Um, and what I might mean by that is, as you probably have seen, many of the producers are basically getting 30% of sales of revenue, um, and um, in, in and that's you know that that's split in terms of the value chain split is just not sustainable, I think, for, for, for the industry and are not healthy for the industry as a whole, too. Thank you. The next question comes from Pablo Planig of Cantor Fitzgerald. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, Judy, I guess, uh, and David, it's a two-part question, but um, so, Judy, maybe you can explain by what you mean by by heightened level of disclosure that NASDAQ would perhaps um, accept. And David, for you, I guess the question is, here we are trying to balance what the auditors want and maybe the SEC and what NASDAQ wants, right? So, so that could be a scenario that we would come to August, right? Nine months from now, a credit transaction is closed. And, and you would, and you would, you would remain listed in NASDAQ and I guess persuade your auditors not to consolidate because NASDAQ is still pending and just provide pro forma numbers, right? So we can all see what the company would look like um, on a quasi consolidated basis pro forma with, with the US assets. So, so that, that could be a plausible scenario and, and please tell me if I'm wrong. And I guess the last one, David, as part of the same subject, you know, Acreage yesterday said that the vote is taking place January 23rd. So if I vote, if I'm a floating shareholder uh, of Acreage and I get my shares, um, if I vote yes on the 23rd, in theory, I would get, you know, my CGC shares in August, uh, nine months after the transaction closes. And then, you know, maybe you're still listening in NASDAQ uh, because there's still this, this paradigm that I just, I spoke about. Um, and, and I would be, you know, voting yes, but getting CGC shares that are listed in NASDAQ potentially besides the PSX. If you can just talk, touch on that first. Maybe you can start, Judy, on the heightened level of disclosure and what I said about, you know, pro forma, not consolidating uh, and, and pleasing NASDAQ that way. And, and I guess I'm convincing your auditors that that can be done. Yeah, so thanks for the question, Pablo. Um, yeah, so... You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say that in general, uh, there's been just a lot of discussion around the structure of the transaction. Uh, we, we, we're going to continue to work with, um, with, 
NASDAQ, we'll work with our auditors, we work with the TSX, we'll work with all of our partners so that we create the the most value for the, the totality of our shareholders. And I remain optimistic that we get an answer that everyone can be um, can be comfortable with. We just we have to go through the process, and um, you know, un- uh, fortunately or unfor- well, unfortunately or fortunately, um, you know, we're we're innovators in this space, and um, that means uh, there's some messiness in in how we describe it. And so, as I said, I, I remain. Uh, I remain uh, confident that we're going to we're going to end up in a place that is is good for all of our investors. And I don't, as we talk about this structure, I don't want to lose the point that what we're doing here is we're 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 taking uh, Acreage and Wana and Jetty with the with the outstanding brands that they have and the the core capabilities that each of the businesses have in in, in distinct markets. And we're putting them together under one umbrella so that they can create value uh, and, and generate profitable um, growth and generate cash flow for our shareholders. And so, again, I think there's a lot of discussion around structure, and it's important because we need the structure to execute on our on our business model. But I, I want to make sure that we keep coming back to these are really good businesses that we're putting together that's going to make them even better businesses. And... Uh, I, as I said, I remain confident that we'll work through all of the um, issues related to listings and disclosures and audit and so forth. Thank you. The next question comes from Andrew Carter of Stifel. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask, thinking through Canada, we're multiple years in. As you said, Judy, the profit pool is still under pressure and the category is decelerating. So I guess I'd ask, with $200 million of costs supporting that business I backed into with the retail, why continue down that road, especially when Canopy USA is probably going to be your top use of capital? I guess I want to add to that, you know, if you were to take some more significant steps, what flexibility do you have under your term debt agreement to do that? And I guess the final thing is, when you close Canopy USA, will your lenders have any recourse on the Canopy USA assets? Thanks. So um, I'll take that. So first, um, Andrew, I I do think we are making progress on our Canada path to profitability efforts, and uh, make no mistake, uh, we are continuing to assess uh, all of our operations beyond what we have announced, um, just to really get to the point where we are profitable in Canada. And, you know, I think David mentioned really the the focus is we have a a footprint that can support our, our premium and mainstream businesses that we're really focused on. Um, additional efforts uh, that we are reviewing, including really optimizing our portfolio, uh, looking at variableizing our costs as much as we can, uh, continuing to look at all of our operating costs, both direct and indirect costs. So, um, you know, I think we really do think it's important to have a self-sustaining Canada business um, while we really uh, scale growth in, in, in the U.S. Um, in terms of the uh, the term loan, really, um, and, and to address your questions about any limitations on the term loan as we think about the Canadian footprint, uh, really no limitations um, uh, to there to really call out. Um, and from a from a, um, a Canopy USA standpoint, um, it's essentially uh, the as the way that it works is is. Before, they did not have any um, collateral of, say, an acreage as, as part of their uh, uh, package, the lender package. Now, just the, uh, the, the canopy grosses exchangeable shares, uh, ownership, through that ownership, uh, they essentially have a, um, uh, an asset that, that they can really uh, think about um, uh, that's credit enhancing from, from their point of view, uh, just given the, the, the ownership structure of canopy grosse to uh, canopy USA. Thank you. The next question comes from John Sampero of CIBC. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. I wanted to ask about your path to achieving positive EBITDA in, in F24. So two parts to this. Um, first, just to clarify, that, that guide now includes your U.S. assets. And, and second, if so, um, given the remaining cost cuts you're planning, seem to only get you about 40% of the way there to positive EBITDA just on the existing business. Should we interpret that as you, you do not expect the existing business as is to achieve positive EBITDA in F24? Thanks. 
Yes, yeah, so I'll take that. So first, um, the comment we made about adjusted EBITDA positive in FI24 was for um, all of our businesses, excluding uh, the investments we're making in, in biosteel, right? So just to level set everyone, if you look at our adjusted EBITDA losses to date, really the, the main drags are Canada and biosteel. And for biosteel, we are making a strategic choice to invest, and you're seeing that uh, really driving the top top line results uh, that we're seeing uh, in our performance, and we continue to expect very strong performance out of BioSteel, leveraging the investments that we're making in, in years to come. From a Canada standpoint, I think I've addressed um, um, in my prior comments that we are really committed to uh, having a Canada business in a profitable shape. So um, as we deliver on the cost savings, as we uh, look at premiumizing our mix and continue to look for additional opportunities, uh, we expect uh, we should be in position to uh, have a positive um, uh, uh, profitability in, in, in Canada uh, on a go-forward basis. And then if you layer in, then potentially the positive adjusted EBITDA that the Canopy USA could bring, uh, you're really looking at a business uh, that we think is pretty attractive from a both growth and profitability standpoint. Uh, but all of that will um, likely to occur once we close on the once Canopy USA closes on the transactions of Acreage, Wana, and Jetty, which, as David alluded to, could take um, a number of months before we get there. Yeah, and you know, Chan, I'd, I'd use your question maybe to build on um, uh, some comments that both Judy and I made during our scripts. Right, if you think about our business and it, it aligns to our new segments that we're reporting in. You know, we have our Canadian business that we're going to continue to drive innovation, we're going to drive distribution, and we're going to really work toward the focus and efficiency in our in our Canadian business that gets us the results that we want. And, and a proof point in that is um, the divestiture that we've announced of our retail assets. We then, you know, talk about BioSteel, which is a brand that we're investing in, but showed almost 300% year-over-year growth. And... You know, we really love the trajectory we're seeing in markets like Ontario, where the brand is maybe a little more well-known and established, but um, is really starting to hit an inflection point. So that gives us, uh, you know, reasons to be excited about that. We've talked a lot about our Canopy USA strategy, but that's really about growing our businesses that are profitable uh, in really strong markets in the U.S. so that we can take a share of the $50 billion total market. But then I also want to layer in our stores and Bickle business, which is coming off of 20 years of consecutive growth. Um, we are continuing to look at driving distribution in that business uh, and uh, working, our, uh, working through some exciting innovation in that business as well. And that's a business that is, uh, that is uh, standalone, uh, profitable, uh, and again, resonates well with our consumers. And then lastly, we really have our rest of world uh, businesses, which includes our U.S. CBD. We're going to continue to function in those markets in an asset-like fashion and be opportunistic as the regulatory environment evolves. And so I think putting our business kind of in that perspective, using our new reporting segments, I think is, is, is a helpful way to think about it because then you can get under the components of profitability that, as, as Judy described, uh, where we have some work to do in Canada, and we're investing in biosteel. Thank you. The next question comes from Nadine Sauré of Bernstein. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I appreciate you saying that including Canopy USA will get Canopy growth global prof to globally profitable on a consolidated basis. But my understanding is you actually won't get access to any of those cash flows. So beyond the cost synergies, which those U.S. assets would enjoy by being under the same umbrella, could you explain the benefits to Canopy growth shareholders today from the creation of Canopy USA? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that, um, Nadine. So I'd say from a Canopy growth shareholder standpoint, you know, obviously having some visibility to the performance of the Canopy USA business uh, that Canopy growth has already paid for in, in owning the majority of those assets and not showing up on their P&L, just having that visibility we think is, is beneficial to Canopy growth. 
The second benefit would be when you think about some of the, uh, the resources, both management time and uh, cash um, uh, uses that, that we are uh, making at Canopy growth level to really advance our US THC strategy. Uh, and we talked about this before, that there is not insignificant amount of money and time that's being spent by Canopy growth. Uh, to really advance our US THC strategy. So by having this Canopy USA structure, we can really streamline the management uh, and, and the resources that the Canopy Growth has also uh, been spending on Canopy USA, while Canopy USA also then takes advantage of the consolidation of their uh, businesses um, and really generate revenue and cost energies um, over time. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, you know, we do expect regulatory progress to happen at some point, right? Maybe not in the next year, but we do think that that will happen. And all of the benefit that Canopy USA uh, would be generating, uh, both from a you know profitability standpoint and the cash uh, generation standpoint, all of that at that point will accrue to Canopy growth shareholders. And it gives us a head start into that market, so that we don't we don't we don't wait until we have a permissibility event and then. Uh, put the assets together. So I think the head start is is important, and uh, it is a legitimate uh, uh, economic asset that um, uh, that's 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 available um, to our shareholders. And clearly, cash flow is available to our shareholders upon permissibility. Thank you. The next question comes from Doug Mam of RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. My question just ha relates to biosteel. Given the growth and uh, it looks like the opportunity for this product relative to the Canadian cannabis business, number one, um, within the next year to 18 months, do you expect biosteel to be a larger business than the Canadian cannabis business? And then number two, as you think about other opportunities and what's gone on on the Canadian cannabis side, when you think about M&A, are other products um, that are similar, let's say to BioSteel, would they come to the top of the list on a return on invested capital basis now, seeing what you've seen over the last while? Yeah, so, so, so look, Doug, we're, we're going to continue to drive BioSteel because we think that um, – uh, we think that we have something really special in the brand proposition and um, the way it resonates with professional athletes and aspiring athletes, and then um, you know the the common uh, consumer. So we're gonna we're gonna continue to to, to drive BioSteel as hard as we can. From an M&A standpoint, um, as a company, we're gonna remain focused on delivering against um, the business opportunities that we have in front of us. Um, as we talked about, an incremental focus uh, and efficiency in our Canadian cannabis business um, and, um, you know, really stay focused on, 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 on what we have um, uh, with the potential on a very small um, scale to be opportunistic uh, in, 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 building, uh, in building our portfolio so that we can go to market ultimately in the U.S. Okay, thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from Bill Kirk, MKM Partners. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so I, I think as part of the deal with Flow, you'll be you'll be co-packing for them at the Virginia facility for for a bit. So I guess how much revenue would that co-packing arrangement generate, and what what is the dur duration of that agreement, and then. On stores in Bickel, uh, Judy, I think you said you expected it to sequentially grow. Uh, is that just normal holiday seasonality, or, or is there something improving sequentially with with discretionary purchases? Thank you. Yep. So uh, I'll pick the SMB and then and then go back to flow. So for from an SMB standpoint, I think the encouraging thing is when you look at Q2 performance, we were down seven percent, but when you exclude currency, we're flat. Right, so sequentially, it is an improvement um, relative to what we saw in in, in Q1, uh, and really the uh, the challenges that we've had with um, some of the distributors in in the U.S. A lot of that is has now been in work through, and we're 
um, you know, getting uh, reorders now from from the distributor that had some some challenges, and we had to pause some shipments there. So we are seeing some of that improvement coming through. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of that is is sort of the the challenges that we had uh, on the distribution side. Um, you know, we're we're behind um, on on a lot of that. We've had some supply chain challenges um, in Q2 as well, and that's also improving. So. Understand that certainly in in the the European markets where the inflationary uh, pressure and and the war uh, in Ukraine is is really posing um, additional challenges in those markets. Uh, but you know I think we are uh, seeing improved trends just from working through some of the um, the internal challenges that SMB had. Um, in terms of flow, um, yeah, you, you're correct in that there will be a period of time that we will be, uh, or guys still will be contract manufacturing uh, for flows um, uh, production. This is really to ensure that we are uh, utilizing the capacity as best as we can. So that also helps um, uh, margin. So it's really less uh, about the revenue, but really uh, efficiently utilizing the capacity of that facility as best as we can. Thank you. Our last question comes from Michael Lavery of Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to come back to the NASDAQ listing, and I appreciate there's uh, quite some time before there may be better clarity on, on where that lands. And obviously, you mentioned the appeal potential as well. But if it, it, the, <clears throat> they push the delist and then deny an appeal, can you just be, clarify if, if your decision is to close the, the Canopy USA deal and delist, or, or to give that up and stay on the on the Nasdaq listing? Which how would you pick? So, so Michael, I, I would just go back to what David said. The, the the decision to announce Canopy USA is to optimize the value of our USTC investment, right? So when you think about what we what we wanted to do and what our priority is, is really uh, the structure allows us to optimize the value of our uh, investments uh, in, in the U.S. and really generate revenue and cost synergies for that entity over time. Um, and so we will continue to work with NASDAQ. We'll continue to have um, dialogues with, with, um, with them to make sure that, that uh, we can uh, come to a, a, a constructive uh, decision, but if you think about our primary motivation for Canopy USA, it is really about value creation, um, and so that's really where we have our um, eyes um, set on. Thank you. That concludes the Q&A portion of the call. I will turn the call back to Mr. Klein for closing remarks. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I mentioned that we feel that uh, we're at an inflection point at Canopy and we're really excited about um, uh, where we sit um, today in the future in front of us. If you're in Canada, I encourage you to try one of our new premium flour uh, and PRJ innovations uh, or a great tasting tweet iced tea guava or deep space ginger ale galaxy. If you're in the US, uh, I encourage you to hydrate with BioSteel RTD beverages or try a Wana Gummy or a Jetty Vape. Uh, investor Relations will be available to answer additional questions. Have a great day.